Hello. My name is uh, Alexander, and uh, with me I have uh, Ulle. Yeah, it's me. Uh, we're presenting on uh, gamified education or uh, student performance related to uh, serious games in education. Yes. <clears throat> now, uh, to start off, I will take a, a brief uh, history lesson of education uh, to give you the kind of background on it. Uh, before we dive into the education um, or the history, I would like to speak some words. Um, when we see children everywhere, uh, which is required to go to uh, school, uh, almost all schools are structured, structured in the same way um, and that our society goes a great deal to, to uh, uh, goes a great deal in trouble uh, and both expense to provide such schools. Uh, we tend naturally to assume that there must be some good logical reason for this. Uh, perhaps if we didn't force children to go to school or if schools operated differently, chil children would not grow and become competent adults, right? Well, there's a very interesting example of a school which is called Sudbury Valley School that tells a whole different story. Uh, for the last 40 years, children at this school have been educating themselves um, in a setting that operates on assumptions that are quite opposite of you know, the traditional schooling. And of course, there have been conducted a lot of studies on these children on the school. Um, and the studies show that graduates uh, become very competent adults and they educate themselves through play and exploration without much of adults direction or prod prodding. And instead of providing direction and prodding, uh, the school provides a rich setting which to play and explore and experience uh, learning for themselves. And uh, yeah, it does it at a lower expense and uh, it requires a lot less from the uh, administration at the school. So why aren't most schools like that if there is a lot of studies that show that it works good? Now, if we want to understand why standard schools are what they are, we need to abandon the idea that they are products of logical and scientific insights. They are instead products of history. So schooling as it exists today only makes sense if we view it from a historical perspective. And so uh, as a first step toward explaining why schools are what they are today, uh, I will present kind of in a nutshell and a very short brief uh, outline of the history of education and uh, <clears throat> be aware it might be taken to uh, a mildly extreme version of it. Um, of course you might com comment on it on the chat so uh, we'll get a discussion on it but uh, yeah let's start. So uh, we, we start in the uh, you know the beginning of human mankind uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, children educated themselves through um, play and exploration and uh, our species uh, schools were uh, or in relation to the to the history uh, schools are very recent institutions so for hundreds of thousands of years before the advent of uh, ag agriculture uh, we lived as uh, hunter gatherers as you may know and the strong drive in children to play and explore presumably came about uh, during our evolution as these hunter-gatherers. Uh, to, to survive, we had to learn and yeah, I, I, I bet they didn't, um, they didn't distinguish between learning um, new things and uh, working. So uh, fast forward several thousand years after the advent of agriculture, um, the education of children was to a considerable degree a matter of uh, squashing their willfulness into order to or to make them good laborers. Uh, a, chil a good 
child uh, was a obedient child. Um, and such education, fortunately, was never fully successful. Uh, the human instinct is to play and explore. And it is so powerful that it will never be fully beaten out of a child. But the f philosophy of education throughout that period, to the degree that it could be agriculture, art articulated, uh, it was the opposite of the philosophy that hunter-gatherers held uh, thousands of years earlier. So uh, as industry progressed and became somewhat automated, the need for child labor declined in some parts of the world. Uh, the idea began to spread that childhood should be a time for learning and schools for children were developed as places for learning. Uh, the idea of and practice of universal compulsory public education developed gradually in Europe from the early 16th century to into the 19th century ish. And with the rise of uh, schooling, people began to think of learning as children's work. The same methods that had been used to make children work in fields and factories were quite naturally transferred into the classroom. Repetition, memorization of lessons, which is tedious work for children whose instincts urge them to constantly play freely and explore the world on their own. Now, in the 19th and 20th century, uh, public schooling gradually evolved to what, toward what we all recognize today as conventional schooling. So uh, the methods of discipline, of course, became more humane and uh, the lessons became uh, more secular, the curriculum expanded as knowledge expanded, and to include an ever-growing list of subjects and the number of hours, days, and years of compulsory schooling increased continuously. So school gradually replaced fieldwork, factory work, and domestic uh, chores as child's primary job. Just as adults put their eight hour day at their place of employment, children today put their six hours day at school, plus another hour maybe at homework and often more hours of lesson outside of school. So over time, children's lives um, have become increasingly defined and structured by the school curriculum. And children now almost universally identify is identified by their grade in school and much uh, much as adults uh, are identified by their job or career so uh, a lot of clever educators might use the word play as a tool to get children to enjoy uh, some of their lessons more and children might be allowed to freely play and recess um, but Children's own play is certainly understood as inadequate as a fun foundation for education. So uh, schools today uh, is the place where a lot of children learn the distinction um, that hunter-gatherers never knew, uh, the distinction between work and play. Uh, the teacher says, you must not work or you must do work <laughs> and then you can play. Um, and clearly, according to this message, work, which encompasses all of school learning, is something that one does not want to do, uh, but you have to. And play, which is everything one wants to do, has relatively little value. And that perhaps is the leading lesson of our method of schooling. So if children learn nothing else in school, uh, they learn the difference between work and play and that learning is work, not play. And this kind of forms our foundation for why we want to explore this topic because um, I have a belief that gamification might turn this, bit, uh, this uh, thought around and using gamification in the educational system um, might have a positive effect on the student's engagement. And we hope to find that there is a brighter future for the educational system for both children and adults. Um, which leads us over to the 
main points of our motivation. Um, the, uh, the topic, which is uh, gamified education, it is well researched. Um, a lot of studies have been conducted on this, um, on this topic. And the studies have different focus areas, of course. Uh, some study only student motivation. Uh, some look at both student motivation and how it uh, affects student performance. Some um, study the learning experience in itself and how, how children learn better with gamification. And so uh, if we look at all of these studies and combining them, uh, I believe we can get a balanced view of the effects on learning motivation, learning experience, and how, how all of these gamification systems um, can, can uh, provide a better platform for learning experience and, and student performance in the end. So uh, the overall impression is that the, the topic is uh, very well researched and it contained a lot of uh, solid research and, and data to analyze. Now, uh, another point uh, or another very important um, number is this 1.2 million. Um, the, uh, the all for ed study uh, found that a large number of students, uh, approximately 1.2 million, uh, this is only in the U.S. Uh, and uh, be aware, it's from 2010. Uh, the study uh, study um, was conducted in 2010. Uh, the numbers are also from 2010, but um, I have not found any newer studies on it. Anyway, the uh, the study found that uh, a large number of students, um, 1.2 million, fail to graduate from high school each year. Uh, the reasons are many, but for us, the most important one is the lack of motivation. The uh, lack of motivation is one of the points that Alfred is pointing out as uh, main main uh, reasons for uh, the dropouts. So, um, uh, as uh, as described uh, in the uh, study, also. Um, Various researchers have identified low attendance or failing grade as a specific risk for this dropout rate. So uh, the logic behind it for me is very simple. When kids are bored in class, it is likely that they won't follow the education. It's that simple. Um, and on the other hand, you have the kids that uh, are able to follow the regular education, right? Uh, even though they are bored. So it's very interesting to look at these two groups, because uh, why do the people or the kids that uh, are able to follow the education, why do they actually do it? And the in incentives uh, are a pure uh, thought process from my side. It's not anything in the study, um, but they might have other incentives, right? Uh, such as they might get rewards from their parents or uh, they might even be scared of their parents being disappointed if they don't perform on a on a level. Um, so it's very interesting to look at these numbers and see how many are actually dropping out based on just the lack of motivation. And yeah, it's it's very disturbing number. Now, so uh, my thoughts here are: um, how how can we help kids to uh, um, who, who have less motivation, uh, how can we make the educational system give them a reason to care about what they learn, right? So the, this can be done by making them believe that they are doing something for a reason. And I think gamification is a great solution to this as it gives the person clear goals. Uh, it is reachable, some of these goals, and they are somewhat visualized. And also at the end of the goal, the person is rewarded with some kind of achievement uh, and, and gives a sense of fulfillment and encourage to further goal seeking. This is the, this is the core of uh, uh, game theory in education. And I, I think that this power of uh, this motivational model that can be applied in an educational context um, can help increase the motivation to keep learning and have a reason to come to school and not drop out. 
And so we hope to find that uh, instead of providing directions and prodding, um, the gamified education can provide a rich setting within uh, children can play, explore, and feel a sense of fulfillment uh, while they are learning. And so you turn this um, old system around to be a more playful and explorational um, system. Now let's uh, talk a bit about what have been done in form of um, studies. Um, um, one study uh, um, or several studies have been conducted as, uh, as I said on this uh, topic. Uh, one of them examined uh, the um, the gamified learning um, by using a pre and post intervention survey and they found that <clears throat> it had a positive impact on student learning this uh, gamification model that they used uh, another study developed a sort of a virtual, virtual tree uh, which grew and developed in response to points which you earned for participation in class discussions. Uh, I think that's very interesting. And um, the results show that the majority of the students reported increased participation in class as a direct result of the virtual tree system. Um, and another study uh, investigated how gamification affects student engagement and learning in enhancement. Um, this was done by exploring the impact of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation on the participation and performance of over uh, 100 undergraduate students in an online gamified learning intervention. And the interesting part here is that they found that Gamified learning uh, interventions have a positive, positive impact on student learning. Um, also, the results show that while uh, it's generally positive, the impact of gamified uh, intervention on student participation varies depending on whether the student is motivated intrinsically or extrinsically, which is very logical to me. Now, um, a typical game have experience points, levels, badges, challenges, leaderboards. Um, and a study applied this uh, game elements uh, in the educational context over the course of five years, uh, where the three first years were non-gamified years and the last two were gamified. Uh, the impact on learning experience was measure measured by comparing data from both gamified and non-gamified years. Uh, using um, different performance measures such as grades and other stuff. Now the results show a uh, improvement in terms of attention to reference materials, uh, online participation and proactivity. And they also suggest that the approach can reduce grade uh, um, differences between students and help them score better. Now um, modeling course activities with game challenges and properly distributing them um, uh, over the term seems to enhance this effect is a, another uh, finding in the study. And actually this, uh, this study is the one that we uh, uh, put out to all of you. Um, of course, uh, we have analyzed it and Ulla will take you through it uh, later, but uh, they found some really interesting stuff and uh, we, we uh, will bring it to you uh, very soon. So uh, let's uh, look at some fun stuff, uh, all right? Uh, the uh, examples from uh, the real world. Now, <clears throat> um, gamification is used in uh, some of the most widespread learning platforms online. Uh, they use game elements like rewarding points, badges, and um, you know, enforces the encourage, uh, encouragement to learn. And uh, one of these platforms is uh, Khan Academy. Um, and um, this is a platform where students uh, learn online uh, by watching videos, practice their uh, practical tasks. 
And um, as you see here, uh, Khan Academy uses uh, badges um, to give their students positive feedback on their progress. And they achieve these badges through learning, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Now, Willow, you may go to the next slide. And uh, as you see here, um, the students also get an overview of the process on a given topic. So um, it's very interesting to analyze this uh, picture because uh, you see them using specific words that you also can put in a game context. So mission, uh, progress, and skills is words that I, I connect very to the uh, uh, video game word. Now, um, also you see the progress bar, which gives uh, the students some kind of uh, visualization of their process. Um, and, and, you know, this might help to further goal seeking as you want to complete this progress circle. Um, also, you see that uh, they have put in a list of uh, skills that you have mastered. Uh, I think this uh, sentence is very uh, funny because uh, it, it's, it's like taken out of a game. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I, I think this applies good to children who are uh, used to playing video games. Now, uh, if you go to the next slide, Ole, uh, possibly um, possible emblems is also another game element that Khan Academy use. Um, I, I think this encourages children to uh, goal seeking or not children, both children and, and uh, adults actually. So um, I think you get encouraged to keep learning um, because you get to achieve these uh, emblems. And <clears throat> You know, when you uh, are in uh, the middle of learning, if you go to the next slide, will it? Um, Khan Academy is very good at continuously giving positive feedback on the progress you make. Um, the messages given to students is containing both texts, icons, uh, which, uh, you know, in enforce each other. And uh, in the end of the learning process, the student is also given a a summary of the performance uh, in addition to some energy points which is collected uh, for each achievement and uh, you collect these energy points and you kind of level up all right so uh, another um, another platform which you might be familiar with it's the uh, it's the Kahoot um, um, most uh, Norwegian students I believe have uh, played Kahoot it's a very fun uh, I, I call it a game uh, it's a very fun uh, game. Uh, it's a, more like a quiz, maybe, but for me, it's a game. <laughs> um, it, anyway, it uses uh, words um, uh, or it uses uh, nicknames. I mean, uh, that um, that uh, is a uh, kind of a familiar game element. Um, and the interesting part is. Uh, is the tall poppy syndrome here, uh, where um, um, students uh, to constrain themselves to not stick out, you know. Uh, facilitators are using tools uh, such as Kahoot to engage students in a better way, uh, because uh, by using these kind of nicknames, the stigma to participate is uh, removed. And um, as they as they uh, use nicknames, uh, the whole quiz becomes anonymous. So, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, it also uses um, a um, a um, uh, kind of waiting lobby where you can see your uh, competition or the uh, participants which are going to uh, be joining the game. And uh, I think this is a great place for uh, building a competition instinct uh, and uh, the players can see their opponents. It's a pre-game lobby, so to say. So uh, the quiz page also gives the player a sense of uh, play and fun uh, by using all of these vibrant colors and um, the uh, ordering task, you have different kind of tasks which the player can be assigned and uh, you know to further build up this competition pillar uh, by uh, showing the answers and uh, time left which you see on the left and right here 
In addition to that, they uh, have a scoreboard at the end of each question. Um, and you give the person a insight to their placement um, at the uh, question. Uh, you also get a, a feedback on your phone or the device you're sitting on, which um, either is a positive or negative answer. And I believe, if I remember correctly, that the, the uh, feedback is um, put in a positive way anyway. So you kind of encourage to further, uh, further quizzing. Now, uh, to build up under the um, competition instinct, which you, uh, which you get here is that they use a scoreboard um, or where the player can get an insight to their uh, placement in the whole uh, scoring system. Now, in the end of the quiz, the students are given a final summary of the results um, and they are awarded uh, medals and points, um, which equals to their performance. And um, if you go one step further, yeah, I think we are going to the last one. Yeah, Code Academy. Um, hopefully some of you have been programming there. It's very fun. And um, the reason why it's fun is it because it's uh, very easy to use. And you also get the, um, the uh, badges, uh, the points, the streaks, uh, which you also find in Khan Academy. Um, and uh, it enforces the learning process and makes you wanna achieve badges. So um, I'm done talking now. I think Ulla will take you through the uh, um, specific paper and if you have any questions to me just uh, put them in the chat and uh, i will be muting my uh, my mic yes so um there was a study done with medicational uh, medical education uh, as you can see here the abcde sim uh, which is a tool provided to teach students as well as uh, as professionals that are finished with school. Um, and the uh, research done on this uh, serious game showed that uh, to give any useful, uh, or to be any useful, the students need to have a certain level of skills and show that uh, a game such as this might not be uh, appropriate for students, but uh, gives a lot of more uh, education for one that's already done with uh, their education. Uh, and while this may be true for uh, ABCD Sim, which focuses on uh, treatment in the emergency room or the emergency ward, uh, it may not be the same for games such as uh, Code Academy or Khan Academy, which creates this sort of uh, mixed classroom or flipped classroom where you're at first given some, um, some lessons before you uh, start producing anything. Um, as well, as you can see in the picture, uh, in this game, the players are given different tools to use. Uh, and there has to be an underlying amount of knowledge to at least know what, uh, what these medical equipments are, as well as how to use them properly and in what, uh, in what order. So over to the specific paper. Uh, so, the paper, as mentioned earlier, uh, explore how gamification can be applied to education in order to improve student engagement. The study gamified a college course by including experience points, levels, badges, challenges, and leaderboards. Um, and the study going over five years, uh, but the first were non-gamified years, and the last two regarded successive, successive experiments of the gamified approach. To assess how gamification impacted the learning experience, we compared data from gamified and non-gamified years using different 
performance measures. Uh, the results showed uh, significant improvements in terms of attention to reference materials, online participation and proactivity. Um, and the uh, participation also uh, were also significant when it came to uh, participation that didn't improve the grades of the students. Uh, as um, as there um, as mentioned, they got experience points. Uh, this was part of uh, part of the grade. So the higher you got on the experience points, the higher grade you would score. Uh, it wouldn't count for the whole grade, but it would be a sort of boost for uh, for the students. Um, in the last decade, the use of technology to improve learning and education has been widely explored as a means to improve teaching. It resulted in the development of different types of flipped classrooms, teaching strategies, where content is delivered online and students work in class to solve problems. Uh, also learning strategies rely on distributed systems to make resources available remotely without any further efforts to make the experience more engaging and rewarding for students. Uh, the study argues that systems like Khan Academy and Code Academy have been used in flipped classrooms, but empirical data to vouch for this kind of method are lacking, uh, which is why uh, they, uh, they started this uh, study. Uh, so, the uh, the paper presents uh, the background and uh, how technology have shaped learning the past decade. They conclude that the common denominator for all of these technologies is that they have not made efforts to make the learning experience more engaging and rewarding for students uh, relating to uh, what we mentioned in the history as one of the main uh, main criteria for success back in the days for our hunter-gatherer groups. Um, they enforce this argument by presenting how it has been successful in other domains such as healthcare, productivity and ecology. Um, and they uh, also give uh, a good picture on what to expect from the paper. Uh, and they state uh, they say three uh, research questions. If their uh, data uh, extracted from early years will uh, be uh, will be uh, proven uh, further by the um, by the data collected uh, from this from this study, as well as um, if the uh, gamified experience will affect the grade, and if the engagement is affected by the second gamified edition of the course. Uh, so they give a. They give us a brief overview of who the participants are, their sources, the variables, and hypothesis. Uh, and the data they need to collect is described as both quantitative uh, as well as qualitative to improve uh, the gamified uh, course between the years. Uh, since they have um, uh, data from both before and after uh, the gamified component was introduced, it gives the uh, it gives the uh, study internal reliability and validity. Uh, um, due to the continuity in their results and methods, uh, 
further increase this reliability, the study is split into two parts. Uh, and uh, as an effect, it increases the accuracy of the conclusion. Uh, but since the um, study does not, doesn't follow uh, one class and it doesn't split one class into two different uh, different groups as they found it unethical. Um, it creates uh, a bias and a um, variable uh, of uncertainty as there may be differences between uh, between students from different years. Uh, the study used the same two professors across all years, uh, but the lab uh, the lab workers were different uh, from the uh, for the two different gamified years, uh, causing another variable there. Uh, as I've mentioned. Um, and this um, this is also uh, causing some decrease uh, with the internal validity uh, since the study was controlled or performed in an uncontrolled environment. Uh, and it did not have any control over variables such as composition of subjects, support materials, uh, and faculty staff, uh, which causes a bit of a problem when it comes to uh, having validity in their, uh, in their conclusion. Uh, one may argue as well that the effects are both directly and uh, indirectly related to the controllable variable. Uh, since student performance is measured by attendance and participation and grades, it touches both directly and indirectly. Uh, participation and attendance seems to be more clearly affected by the gamification of the course, while the grades may be tied to participation and attendance more than gamification. Uh, So an analysis of their theory, um, the gamified features that they use are badges, leaderboards, and experience, uh, as you can see here. Um, they, um, they do not uh, mention how big the leaderboard is or how uh, how each student can measure themselves up, let's say, uh, compared to Kahoot, where you get a number of where you are in the quiz, uh, but only showing the top five uh, for the whole class. Uh, when it comes to uh, the challenges, they had uh, theoretical challenges as well as practical challenges. Uh, one given online and one uh, contained to the uh, lab. Uh, these were given good feedback from the students as they were able to uh, proceed with the uh, course in a more fun way, while the badges uh, got some uh, bad feedback due to the fact that people were uh, push to talk in class, uh, which some people didn't find particularly uh, fun, which may bring back to uh, what we mentioned earlier, the tall poppy syndrome, uh, known in the Scandinavian countries as Janteloven. Uh, it isn't uh, something that everybody likes uh, to speak up in class, 
and some of these uh, badges were given for correcting uh, the professor, which is also something that people may not like to do. Uh, and there the question comes is, is it part of the course to participate like that or should one that uh, keeps for themselves isn't um, talking that much in class but contributes in other ways? Should he uh, lack the amount of badges he gets, he or she gets because they don't like to speak up in class uh, or should it be like that, that they have uh, that they have to push themselves themselves out of uh, their comfort zone to uh, uh, acquire these badges. Um, the psychological model, model that they uh, base themselves on is called the uh, self determination theory, and their focus is on increasing the intrinsic motivation. Uh, something that I really don't understand as uh, I would say that serious games is more of an extrinsic motivation with the badges, experience points and leaderboards. Uh, and they do not uh, explain it properly in the paper, but I would suspect that what they're meaning is uh, that the uh, focus is on by using uh, serious game in their extrinsic <coughs> motivation, uh, they may create uh, an intrinsic motivation based uh, based on the fun they have. Uh, but I would really like to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, I don't think that you can increase intrinsic motivation uh, just like that. I think it's something you either have or you don't have and you need to find the joy in, in something to be able to get the intrinsic motivation. Uh, further on, uh, one of the l things they lack in their uh, in their work is they have no development framework or they don't mention one uh, but their work is iterative um, as we can see in the paper they improve their gamified course each year based on the feedback uh, from students making it look similar to the ADE model which analyzes designs, develops, and implements, and evaluates. Um, since, uh, since the iteration is part of the study and not done beforehand, uh, it may create another uh, problem and another uncontrolled variable that they don't mention in the study. Uh, but changing your uh, variable uh, based on the feedback may have caused that uh, may have caused an, an increase or decrease in participation or in the grades without really uh, showing uh, where it comes from. So their idea uh, with gamifying the course is, I would say, good. Uh, they uh, increase um, things highly close to uh, serious games. Uh, and they, uh, they get good results from it. They increase participation both in uh, attendance that causes uh, grade uh, a rise in the grade, as well as 
participation in things that doesn't really uh, give there any give them any um, give them any um, direct feedback other than enjoyment of the class, which may show that uh, they actually have increased the intrinsic motivation. Um, one thing uh, that is problematic with the badges is that it isn't, um, there is no guarantee that it's tied up to the uh, course in a way that will improve their grade on the final exam. These are more for show. Uh, and as it is mentioned in the paper that some of these uh, some of these badges are for spotting bugs in uh, the lectures and things like that it um, it is nothing uh, or many of the badges have no uh, relation to the uh, to the grades themselves so they're entirely focused on motivating students to participate in class and close pay, pay close attention, but uh, one have no guarantee that uh, that it works. Um, and when it comes to the uh, psychological model, we we'll say they chose a good one, and they, uh, as it says in the slide, a uh, bad usage may not be the uh, perfect use of word uh, good wording but they seem to uh, do the right thing by creating a motivation there with the gamified content but the way they word themselves in the papers seems to uh, be a bit um, hard to understand what their goal is and whether they have achieved it or not at the end. Um, one of the things that's really lacking in the paper is a dedicated place to describe the method of their work. It is clear that they are gathering uh, quantitative data uh, by measuring attendance, downloads of lectures, uh, and participation in leaderboards, uh, in forums, I mean. Uh, but there is no clear uh, clear expression of what method they want to use to measure the results uh, early on. And uh, as well as the work done with uh, the method that they have chosen, they are manually extracting a lot of data as well as manually running scripts each day to update the leaderboard. Uh, and all of this manual labor uh, is a uh, is a uh, opportunity for human errors uh, as these things are done on a daily basis it's uh, it's hard to measure if if they have been uh, good at uh, keeping keeping up with the task each day over a five year period uh, and their evaluation uh, I would say they are doing a good evaluation as they clearly see they see the biases and faults in the work they've done uh, they uh, identify uh, uncontrolled variables such as the faculty uh, teachers and that they have no possibility of splitting the class in two uh, so they they base their um, their um, data on several years and not only one uh, and they uh, they also evaluate uh, the feedback given from uh, students and adapt to these 
on the way, but this might have been something that should have looked at earlier to uh, decide whether or not uh, participation by speaking up in class, by uh, by completing these badges would be something that needs to be done to get a good grade or whether it should only be uh, or whether it should be toned down and be participation in general. And that concludes our first half. Any questions? Thank you very much, first of all, for your uh, elaborate uh, discussion of both the general content and the paper. Um, but before there are any comments, um, you know, the question is, should we have a break first, perhaps for everyone involved? Um, because that was uh, a, a solid 50 minutes talk. Um, and uh, then we can still um, follow up with discussion or is anyone keen in having discussion first? I see some, uh, now using the pictograms here, I see some indications that people prefer a coffee break. So um, what about we instill one of those until a quarter past one? Is that a sensible time frame? That sounds good. That sounds good to you guys as well. And it seems the audience at least, yeah, yeah there seems to be a somewhat uh, a quorum that suggests that it's the right frame. Okay, let's meet quarter past. So everyone has time to reflect on this talk, this rather extensive talk, and then we continue from there. But thank you very much for now. Thank you. Thank you. institutional otherwise funding whereas in the training case it's relatively straightforward right because it's externally funded uh, is that your point or not yeah okay um okay um so yeah i think that's that's the bigger picture that's worthwhile uh, discussing keeping in, in, in mind more generally you know what 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 actually are we actually analyzing observing is it more like gamification um, of um, other themes and topics, or is it really a serious game as a, you know, uh, um, in, in its pure sense? Um, I think it's something that we can keep in the back of our mind. But coming back to the specific um, aspect of the discussion, um, I just wanted to, um, is this, does anyone want to make a specific comment related to this uh, talk? I see some people are still in the break, or is it? Right, so I wasn't, uh, okay. Ah, Runa has something to say, I believe. Can you hear me? Yeah. Microphone's working? Yeah. Doesn't always. Uh, two comments, or maybe questions, or maybe both. Uh, uh, so you were saying with regards to the uh, self-determination theory that uh, they were looking more at the extrinsic motivation than intrinsic one. But I do think that they have a good discussion on their page three, where they say at least where they, where they say why they consider this to be uh, addressing the SDT, and they say how they pr try to uh, accomplish autonomy uh, just under the figure one there, uh, and try how they try to boost competence and improving relatedness. So, so I think they did try. Uh, whether they did enough and whether they really met it, that there's a discussion, but I, I think that they tried to frame it at least, that they tried to uh, uh, kind of match the intrinsic motivation of the students. Um, the the question or the my concern with this type of research is that uh, they are kind of comparing apples and bananas or, or maybe apples and, and carrots uh, in the sense that Obviously, or I think that they're spending a much more resources. They give the students much more feedback here than what they did in the non-gamified. So the question is, how much did actually the game element contribute, rather than the students having more focus, more attention, more feedback, more enthusiastic lecturers, uh, and and being followed more clearly, clearer goals, objectives, activities. So there's lots of things that differ. I think from the, the three first years and two last years, and, and not all of that would fall under the category gamification. So it'd be interesting to see what they do now, eight years after or, or seven, eight years after, or if they still continue doing this way, or did they find that they could uh, 
they didn't have to have the gamification part or was it too expensive altogether to to be so on and provide so many resources into the into lecturing any comments from you guys who read the paper uh i uh, agree on the second one on the first one i i do agree that they uh, as you say they they try to um narrow it down to the autonomy competency and relatedness as you mentioned uh what i what bothers me with it is that it seems to be that they want to increase the intrinsic uh motivation and i and my thought at least is that um much like uh if you use um or the words i've been uh, seeing uh, related to this before this class was uh, inner and outer motivation and here sure i believe that you can provide outer or extrinsic motivation that in the long run will uh will give you some sort of satisfaction to uh do the certain things and uh create some sort of intrinsic motivation there but i feel like the wording is a bit poorly uh and although they um they seem to create the result uh, as you mentioned in the second question at uh, at least from personal experience i know that when we are uh, having classes with external people that are coming there to to partake or uh, do a study on us the the motivation increase uh just from that so how much the results uh come from um the gamification itself or whether it was from the intensive feedback and the fact that they have um people from the outside coming in to to do a study on them is hard to say uh and i would also like to point out that um i feel like if they want to uh see if the um the uh whether or rather than focusing on grades if they had a possibility i think they should also have measured how much they uh remember of the course let's say 5 years later or 10 years later or maybe not that long but uh it seems to have increased their uh their joy with uh with the course and i think if you if you increase the joy of uh of a course or of something it sticks with the person much longer than just just by uh fulfilling a course in a normal way i see some hands we could can I just uh, add one more reflection on that uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, because I, I the question uh, i'm I'm, uh, I'm having in mind is if you use budgets would that always be extrinsically motivating i think what they did in this case is to design the badges and the experience points in such a way that it aligns very well with what is the supposedly the outcome of the course so if there is a good alignment between the badges and experience points or whatever you do and the outcome you could say that uh, the the scoreboards or whatever becomes more like a dashboard it tells the student where they are good and where they're not so good and that is kind of a detailed feedback that would intrinsically motivate because then they get a better picture of what they already master what they don't master and they can see the progress in their own mastery so so it doesn't necessarily have to be extrinsic i mean if they did just care about the points absolutely if they just care about being the first on the leaderboard obviously but the fact that you break down their accomplishments their their contributions into finer grain and you can provide as i said kind of a dashboard that would tell in each student how well they are doing what they, what they are mastering and they can see that progress it will also intrinsically because then they get the feeling for oh okay i am actually mastering this that i was supposed to learn so, so i think it doesn't have to be uh, uh, extrinsic even though you have uh, badges uh, like this or, or experience points like that so i think it matters a little whether it how well it aligns with with what is um uh, what is course is about and, and what the students 
uh, their own objectives, their own goals. Fiona? Yeah, so uh, just a quick comment to uh, what was mentioned earlier. Uh, the paper point out, uh, I can't remember which page, but they point out uh, the um, participation uh, for the various uh, groups and it seems that uh, forum activity would or had or increased uh, actually a lot uh, uh, during the um, or for those that uh, did serious games or was in that class uh, but I also agree with you know that to get a better view on it they should have uh, had more metrics looking at uh, various other uh, participation activity. <clears throat> so just to, uh, if I may, I'm not sure if there's anyone else currently in the loop uh, in the queue, then I will, no. Um, so just to, to follow up on both, uh, I agree with, with both of you. I mean, what I get from Runa is, well, it doesn't really matter. Let it be extrinsic or intrinsic, as long as they participate and perform better in the end, sensible move. Um, but the paper indeed makes some sort of claim that they look at intrinsic motivation in particular. They made a lot of promises, or rather they describe all the mechanics they have introduced to facilitate uh, an, up, uh, an increase in intrinsic motivation. But what, what my problem with this is, um, uh, if you if you describe this and you're motivated, you need to have a sensible assessment. So I find it's a bit of a methodological shortcoming there um, because um, they only tell us in the end what happened in the system, but they did not tell us why it happened in the system. Um, they acknowledge this in the end because they rationalize or realize the shortcomings you know, cohort uh, um, effects that may be, may be in, involved in there and others. But um, why haven't they just asked students some of the questions, right? Why did you, you know, in, in increase your involvement uh, in, in the course? Uh, you know, why did you pose those kind of issues and so on? Because then they would actually get an, at least some sort of uh, a level that would allow them to draw any conclusion with respect to the intrinsic motivation. Right? So, and, and unless they can actually evaluate this or link this back, they should not entertain any claim uh, as to, you know, uh, in how far they may or may not have increased intrinsic motivation. So the paper basically substantiates what Runa says. Uh, it, it, they, they did something more or less, in this case more, but it's not really clear what it's linked to. So in this slide, I think there's a bit, uh, as, as uh, um, Ole uh, said, it's a bit, a bit of a misrepresentation as to you know, what they think they actually um, uh, display here or what they actually uh, evaluate as part of the paper. Anyway, that's just my um, thought on this one. Um, any other points? Um, well, an another point uh, that links back to uh, one of the, uh, uh, what, what has been uh, said by the presenters just before as well is, um, the tall poppy syndrome, right? So the, the aspect of those uh, leaderboards of, of having individuals standing out. And it really comes back to a the uh, evaluation point of view. Um, and as far as I understand, what is fairly underreported are the standard deviations. I mean, we see them as uh, box whisker shards with a lot of uh, goodwill, we can interpret them and so on. Uh, but it's it's important to actually look at the the spread, right? So even though if the mean has may have increased um, in terms of uh, overall grades and forum posts and so on, how did this affect the um, stratification thereof, right? So for example, if you know know that you end up on a leaderboard, does it necessarily drive you to perform extremely well, or will it just you know antagonize or or, or moderate your commitment to the class in the first place? So it may well be that uh, there may be a, la a higher stratification between good marks and bad marks, if you like, whereas overall uh, the marks increase. So you may have traded uh, overall performance for uh, um, inequality, right? So which may or may not be desirable, but in any case, something that's important to report, I believe. And I'm not 100% convinced that it is convincingly done in this um, uh, um, um, paper. Um, so that's just a minor comment. Perhaps you have other views. Uh, I totally agree with, uh, with that part uh, when it comes to uh, degrees and as I mentioned early on in the uh, in the paper is that they want to uh, diminish the spread in grades, uh, which is the reason why I believe that the extrinsic motivation is what should be 
in focus and the reason why I've been caught up with it because as we mentioned or as Alexander mentioned in the earlier part one of the big reasons for uh, dropouts and and people uh, failing high school um, graduation is the lack of motivation uh, which makes me think that okay rather than focusing on uh, leaderboards and the um, the um, the rather than focusing on uh, the top part, they I feel like they should have focused more on the uh, bottom half of the class to to raise uh, to raise the grades from there. And also, as you say. Uh, would have been nice if they had some more detailed um, data to to show whether or not the uh, the uh, leaderboard had the effect that they wanted or if it uh, caused problems there's I know it caused problems for those that were not at the top uh, there were some quite uh, quite strong words used uh, close to to hate uh breathing within those that that weren't in the top of the class towards those that were on the top of the uh leaderboards due to the badges they got that i felt uh put them in an undesirable spot because they didn't want to uh participate with uh, uh orally in the classroom as well as other badges that put them on the spot. Interesting observation, yeah. Um, mm, I follow your point. Uh, Runa has a comment, I believe. Yeah, on top of, interesting when you mentioned the dropout, because on top of page four, they just say that uh, for the years we had 52, 62, 41, 35, and 52 students respectively excluding those that dropped out. Now, if you're interested in a dropout, why didn't they look at where there were more or fewer students who dropped out? And what was the motivation or what was the rationality for dropping out? I mean, if you like to improve dropout rate, you should probably also focus on those who actually dropped out during the course. That's a good point you're making, actually. Particularly the, the qualitative aspect as to why they dropped out, right? Uh, exactly. Like you want to isolate cohort effects from um, um, you know, delivery-related um, aspects. Yeah, that's interesting. Very good point. Um, it may actually be a clearer metric uh, with respect to the entire success of the experiments than any of the other metrics, uh, especially if not reported with um, standard deviation. Any other comments by anyone? Well, I mean, I think most of the main points have, I think, been captured. Um, so, yeah, no, we talked about the qualitative, quantitative stuff, uh, possibly issues with the metrics. Um, it's a bit of a pity that they, uh, have really so crudely focused on quantitative measures. It, it was it's so obvious in a reading that it's all about counting stuff, uh, but it's not really clear what that actually means in that context. So that's something that I found incredibly clear um, through, or very obvious throughout the paper. We discussed this, but this is something uh, to take away from it. If you really want to go down to this level, you need to have more deeper insights. You can't just rely on numbers and scripts. Uh, and uh, apart from the issues that that arise from using scripts and uh, doing running those manually, um, uh, but but you you need to put more effort into actually identifying the reasons underlying particular behavior. Um, that that is particular, I think, uh, central if you if you aiming at education and motivation in particular. Um, so, because yeah, so that that's that's one of the points. Um, all right. Um, for your for your for your paper in particular for the for the review, I think it's really helpful. In your previous talk, it, you listed a lot of um, studies that, in one way or another, touched on this issue um, of of um, 
educational performance uh, and, 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 and serious games or gamification features more generally. I think it's really, it would be interesting to really contrast and link or relate those uh, studies, what they looked at, what they did do well, what they did not do well, and what's the common problem um, that you find across those studies, because I suspect there are some. I mean, uh, Runa pointed at the cohort effects, uh, for example, that it's really, really hard to 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 to, to separate uh, the effects of uh, cohort, but also the attention to it. Um, does anyone recall the effect um, that we can attribute to this um, 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 phenomenon? What's what's the effect called when we pay uh, that that people perform differently um, if they experience a different form of attention? Right, I don't either. So um, then we can <laughs> the Hawthorne effect, no? Aha, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that's right. So uh, but, but let let me just add yep. one comment there because uh, in this mm -hmm. case the Hawthorne effect may uh, affect or have an impact on two types of uh, participants. It could be the students they're mm -hmm. being observed, but it's more likely going to be the the actual lecturers because they're also being observed and they know that this is part of the study, so they may that's behave good. very differently, and that will indirectly also affect the learning. That is a very good point. Um, that's right. That's a multi-party uh, attention that actually occurs. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, mm -hmm. So in this slide, uh, it would also be interesting to see how other studies deal with this, right? And wh who is the uh, subject of investigation here, uh, more or less? A very good uh, observation. Yeah, so that's that's one there. Um, just going back to your, um, since there's no explicit comment right now to the paper, um, and I think we covered largely our ground, uh, to your earlier studies, uh, you're pointing to um, the um, change and the shift of the role of education over the uh, uh, centuries. And of course, uh, we didn't, I mean, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that you, you uh, um, should have, we should give a, um, can capture a detailed account of all this, uh, but it's an interesting um, uh, pitch that you provoked uh, by suggesting that hunter gatherers uh, largely learned by uh, learned from what they actually need to do, right? So um, work equals education to some extent. Whereas uh, in in the later uh, stage, later development uh, onwards, sixteenth century onwards, there was a bit more, um, yeah, it's a bit more conception of having uh, education as a discipline in its own right, independent of work, right? More like a work preparation scheme, in a way. And uh, and and and, uh, and and while it seems like a distinct uh, transition from one to the other, um, it may not actually be so much because we still have concepts such that uh, resemble this uh, work equals learning approach. Um, 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 I, I, does anyone know those concepts in the real world? They still exist? Uh, I think I would say um, Steiner School in Norway it seems okay. to be quite, uh, I haven't uh, been there myself, but what I've understood from friends I have uh, that have gone there, it seems to be more like, oh, uh, learning is fun and uh, more on the focus uh, or more like uh, what it was before other than how it is today with the classroom um, right. I think yeah right okay that's that's an interesting uh, uh, direction um, I was more aiming at the um, uh, uh, um, work-life learning relationship um, and um, I mean the the concept of apprenticeships um, still captures that to some to some extent of course there's a scholarly component there but largely it's uh, related to learning on the job right so learning by doing to a large extent uh, and this is kind of still a resemblance of this uh, um, um, this this is uh, somewhat this transition um, but the other aspect that relates to learning that has changed over the um, well, over over turns over centuries mostly is also that we have experienced a shift from skill-centered to knowledge-centered learning, right? So it's no longer um, possible in some respects to try everything out that you want to learn about because we need to deal with more abstract concepts and more uh, general knowledge and so on. Uh, and this this has shaped the necessity to shift uh, towards more. Uh, you know, lecture style slash classroom settings as opposed to doing everything by experimentation. Right, so um, 
And that's largely what, what it would mean if you do it in a physical environment. You try something out, learn from it. Very effective. That's um, um, we still we all have apply this, but in some instances you simply can't. And our education system have shifted towards this uh, knowledge centrism, where you talk about abstract concepts, systematic processes, and things like this. And that's just very hard to 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 test in the real world. I think that's quite uh, important to bear in mind. Um, as well, that it's not just that we wanted to change our learning, uh, learning and attitudes towards learning, but the necessity has shifted as well. Um, yes, so that was the comment there. But um, this was a very, very good insight. I think there are comments here. Um, I don't know what order either either Ule or uh, Rune. Um, you 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 know, whoever wants first, I guess. Um. Just to comment on the, uh, as you mm. said, the necessity uh, was also what uh, brought us, um, at least in the around the industrialized uh, industrialization revolution, uh, there was more need for um, labor workers in factories. Which uh, I don't have a paper for it, but I uh, mean to read somewhere that. The reason it's built like it is is to uh, is to uh, make sure that the uh, students were more capable of uh, moving directly into a factory right after they were educated. Uh, and as you said, as things have um, have changed over the years, we are more uh, we have to think more in the uh, abstract way that we can't learn by doing in everything. Uh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, it's true. And following up on that, mm -hmm. I think it's it's uh, that the, the picture you were drawing is kind of ignoring the the change in society because what has happened since then is that the need for knowledge is much. Uh, uh, much more significant. I mean, what we need to know and what we learn today is, of course, thousands of times much more than what it was in the in times of gathering and hunting. And the complexity is increased, specialization is increased. So you can't expect one parent to teach everything they do to the kids and have the kids play uh, play role plays and everything and learn the same thing. I mean, it's, it doesn't work that way. And and also, uh, it's quite unsafe, I think, to bring kids along and, and provide a safe learning environments for many of the jobs and many of the skills uh, that we need today. So, so I think the whole society kind of is also driving this uh, uh, education into becoming much more a specialized uh, task in its own right. It's not something that you could do in smaller groups. And, and I mean, the, the, the uh, amount of knowledge you, you need to, to, to deal with the, and skills and, and the, the size and the depth and, and the complexity and the specialization. The fact that parents can't necessarily deal with, uh, with the uh, playing with the kids as, as one probably could uh, at some time, it, it, it is a big change. So, so I think it's a bit simplistic to say that, okay, we, 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 we lost our, um, our um, fun for, for play and or our, uh, seeing games and play as a way to learn. I, I think that's kind of a bit uh, simplistic. So, so there, there's, it's harder to see how this could be, um, that kind of approach could be done on a large scale today because one, even if you don't like to, to say it, one of the, the biggest challenges we have to provide the kind of interactivity and the kind of um, learning environment that we would like to have would be resource wise. Because before there were much, less to to learn and, and you can learn in from in smaller groups now we have many more people and the complexity of what you need to learn is much more so it's, it becomes a research issue i think that the, tra the traditional or the, the the modern kind of, of teaching and learning is more on how can we scale this effectively so we have uh, a good enough education that we can actually, uh, we have the resources to actually provide and, and deliver. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we also, I mean, we had specialization earlier in this, um, for example, 16th century onwards, 
there's a reason why many people are called Smith uh, by surname, for example. Uh, I don't know. Um, there would be numerous other examples, but um, that's right. It, particularly, the intergenerational shift in occupation uh, makes drives the necessity of having more efficient schemes um, of of learning and relearning. Right. So it's no longer that you have you have a stone smith that you that your children are likely to inherit this this uh, occupation. It's true. Any other comments um, regarding the talk or uh, paper or follow-ups? It's this, this awkward silence of the digital realm. Um, no one, not even, a, you know, yeah, yes, anyone, Bjorna, please. So just a, just a, con a bit of a continuation on the, on the um, state of uh, mm -hmm. serious games uh, that this is building on. And uh, I think that with uh, several small projects or at least projects that are being tested out in small scale, uh, it will lead to a um, more general role or in the end or in, in the later will implement this on a larger, larger scale, but you still need to have uh, or you have the research papers, but you also need to have examples of successful implementation to see that it actually works on the uh, or outside the the, the testing facilities uh, in a way. So uh, yeah, uh, but you have these uh, examples now with. Um, I can't remember the company, but there is uh, a class in Elbrim um, now that is doing uh, implementing this in uh, at the uh, high school level, um, where they where they have uh, math teaching uh, via VR. So it's coming, but it's it also it, it needs more uh, time for uh, for it to be more generally accepted and also tried out uh, for it to be more fully accepted by the by the by the school or the um, uh, school platforms. But is that an uh, issue of equipment in your view? I mean, you're talking to me about VR in particular, and that's you know an obvious. Uh, uh, limit to scalability is resource availability. Um, so, do you think it's a more generally applicable and generally useful um, approach, or do you think it's more limited to really uh, applicable in very specific contexts? I think that it's so far they are in very specific uh, scenarios that they are used. Uh, where they want to try out, uh, for instance, VR or using VR for uh, math. Uh, right. But the thing is that that costs development, and since nobody have this off-the-shelf uh, software that can be used, uh, development time is still needed to do anything. Uh, but also, when this uh, might, uh, or when you actually start to get uh, stories that. For success stories, uh, that software can be converted into uh, shelf software to be um, more cheaply used or uh, acquired. Mm. So yes, there is a, uh, there is a hardware limit, but I think there is mostly the uh, development limits, and that not many schools can afford or want to uh, risk spending the, all this money because you, you will need a company that is firstly available and wants to uh, be willing to, to have the, the risk partially on their shoulders also uh, because this development alone is not, it's not something a school uh, can do. And, and that's, so I think it might, it's mostly an economic limit uh, summing this up. Right. Yeah. That's probably so. Serious game still is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, like, a, a, yeah, kind of uh, first world kind of uh, phenomenon uh, to some extent, right? Unfortunately, in this respect. Mm. 
Ah, there's a, there's a uh, follow-up by Nakul uh, to everyone. That's actually uh, a good point. Um, suggestion on the slides that would be good to put more text on the slides. Uh, um, I felt the same to some extent in um, um, just as minor feedback to to um, um, Ole and Alexander um, on the. Uh, there was one slide called uh, existing studies or. Um, on serious games um, so basically and that that's where you entertained a long uh, running narrative which was really insightful and, and uh, uh, could learn a lot but it would be, would be good opportunity just to link those studies there and may it be just by reference or briefly by their respective uh, theme right so and then including a reference so it would be easier then for everyone to follow up afterwards i think that's a valuable um um, a valuable point uh, made here. So it would be a lot easier because, you know, make use of the medium, right? Make use of the visual medium in particular. Um, and Aruna um, uh, um, contributes to it and suggests um, there should be more figures for the discussion to support it, um, which is, um, yeah, of course, again, it's a matter uh, of using the medium effectively, not just um, 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 using using um, the, 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 the audio, but also perhaps of you know um, slides or videos if you like. Uh, but it, it would be good if you could expose um, at least inject a reference to those studies. That would be really helpful. And as I mentioned before, I explicitly encourage you to uh, make use of those studies that you evidently have explored at this stage um, when you create the report. Right. So it would be quite essential to relate in what you do. The 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 report should by no means be only constrained to one single paper. That's very important. Yes, uh, we we are uh, aware of that, and uh, we, of course, uh, in the report we will do it. But uh, we wanted to keep it uh, very simplistic and uh, easy to follow. So. Yeah. yeah. No, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's good. we could follow. That was straightforward without any point. But it's mostly like for following up. If I were to look at it in one week, it probably would be a lot harder to recover uh, all the details you have provided us with. Um, good. Um, did anyone had a look at the uh, template that I linked to the GitLab uh, um, wiki? Good uh, or not good, no one did. So um, I encourage you to do so. Um, and so then we can have a bit of a Q&A question about this uh, latest in the late next session, but perhaps it'll be earlier by issue or the like, if it's somewhat unclear. Again, those are just templates for you to uh, potentially develop papers. I can perhaps briefly share them on, uh, oh, no, no, that, that which, would which template are you talking about? The IEEE format? Or? The, yeah, all right, that's, that's the painful bit. Um, sorry, you picked up on this. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's the painful one. Anyone who hasn't had uh, had to play with the IEEE format, I urge you to do so. But I did already earlier in the semester, so I assume everyone did. Um, um, but th this is one to know. What I mean is on the um, on the right side, I introduced a, a wiki page called Paper Structure. Right, you go into wiki, you have the main page, and there's some reference to the uh, paper structure. It's also linked from that uh, from, from that main wiki page, just uh, what you pointed to, the IEEE uh, link, just uh, if you continue the sentence for details on the report, see here. And that makes reference to the proposed paper structures, uh, differentiated into two types of papers. If you were to give me the share screen um, space, I would just share that with everyone. Um, yeah, so I'll take the liberty to to do so. I share my second screen. There we go. And now you will see what I see exactly. So um, here's the main wiki page. On the right side, we have paper structure here. It's also linked from down here. And um, we have, I, I would imagine, two types of reports. One of them uh, being more focused on being an overview paper. So that would be related to uh, what we had, for example, uh, today. Uh, so where we have a specific paper that has is written by someone else, but discussed in the context of the um, the session itself, but also su you know supported with additional background work and uh, you know uh, theoretical elaborations where they are relevant. For example, you have multiple papers; they have a shared theoretical background because they, for example, rely on the um, self-determination theory or others. Um, so they could be outlined as well. And this would be a possible proposed structure. This is not hard and fast. It was more for people that are 
looking for some guidance um, on how to structure this paper that could be a possible pathway. Uh, but again, that's by no means prescriptive. So having an introduction, providing some background method um, uh, that you use to develop this overview, this survey, you know, is it narrative approach, systematic lit review and so on. And then the results, meaning with results, I mean the actual content that um, in the case of the systematic literature review, this also includes, of course, you know, the number of papers filtered that you reviewed, but uh, it could also just be in a narrative case, the providing an overview of the different papers you want to discuss, right? So, and at the end, there should be some sort of synthesis. So, you know, some overarching insight or theme that you derive from there, uh, be that before then concluding this entire paper in a summary, uh, briefly discuss what uh, uh, what we have learned from doing so, kind of a take home message and where to go from here. So what you will find there in survey papers is generally the idea, where are gaps in research, right? So what do we know now? What did we learn? Substantive new knowledge, uh, for example, um, that uh, the use of serious games is useful in particular areas, uh, in particular disciplines in a classroom setting. I mean, I'm just making up, um, but what are gaps? For example, the use of qualitative data in the context of uh, um, um, assessment of effectiveness um, um, of serious gains in classroom settings has not been researched. I mean, it could be an outcome. So if you see gaps, obvious gaps. Mind you, can sometimes be harder to do that in a narrative overview because you're not comprehensively scouting the field, but it could, you, could, you can at least tentatively dare to say where more work could be needed or would be needed. Right, so that's a classical starting point of a master thesis um, to kind of think about this, look at the background, but and then identify. Christopher, yeah, can, yeah. I can I just add one comment, and that on the synthesis part. So if any of you would like to get A or B, then you need to have a strong synthesis. Without the synthesis, it's uh, it's could at the best be good work, but doesn't show that kind of analytical capabilities and level of independence that we expect from an A or a B. Isn't that right? Absolutely, absolutely. Else is just a rundown of summary, summary, summary. We don't want this. We want to have kind of, yeah, an emergent structure. So it's a very good point you're making, Runa. And a structure they can see, you know, this paper looks as more, you can structure it by discipline. You can structure it uh, discussion, for example, uh, by, by, by methodology, by approaches, by theory and so on. We want to see a bit of this organization, bit of, put it this way, that's the, your space to be actually be creative. Um, because you can design this paper and the discussion around this. In all other cases, it's largely more or less prescriptive how you go about those things. Uh, and that's what we kind of really want to see. If you just uh, summarize paper after paper and don't link them, don't relate them, and uh, provide an overarching structure in the end, then it will be of limited, uh, uh, yeah, A and B is, um, could be out of reach then, yeah. unless there's some other uh, gem that we uh, oversee right now. That's a very good point. The other case is the development paper. So some of you uh, have entertained the idea of actually developing a prototype, right? Either conceptually or even with implementation. And um, their, their, their thesis, or sorry, their structure will of course a bit diff be a bit different because it's centered largely around their contribution. That is here yeah, specifically the development, right? development framework they use, the underlying motivation, architecture, the gamification elements need to be discussed. And then perhaps if an uh, evaluation exists that may be, uh, either from testing by using other individuals or themselves or a conceptual task or, um, you know, uh, yeah. So, um, and then a reflection on it. So what's, what is good, what is bad, what is ugly. So to identify the potential of this prototype, um, then um, and this is kind of the core of that particular paper. There still needs to be some sort of pointer to other people's in their work, but it's by no means as comprehensive and it doesn't need that strong of a, uh, um, a coverage of that uh, work area, as long as all the more Im immediately related works are captured sufficiently, right? And then the discussion centers more about how does whatever you did fit into the field. Here it's more like, uh, based on what we observed in the field, what could be contributed to the field by your or others' future work. Here's what did you do, briefly contextualized here, and then see how does it link back to the wider field? What are the opportunities? What, 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 what did we do well and what could we have done better? You know, and what could be done in extension? Or perhaps even to discard the idea, say, oh, yeah, actually it didn't make sense because, right? Based on testing, for example. So this is more centered around an individual contribution or group contribution rather, in terms of a game development. And this is the standard approach of uh, surveying an area of field. 
Um, I encourage you to have a look at this uh, template and uh, feel free to ask questions and also feel free to deviate from it. Um, so if you, you know, so th there's no, by no means a hard and fast answer and only a single right way. Uh, it's very important to note. I notice a raised hand, please um, just, just barge in and uh, interrupt me. Uh, just wondering, mm -hmm. um, based on the, um, let's say you follow the first paper, the overview paper, mm -hmm but you would like to uh, create some sort of uh, demo uh, based on a conclusion on what this, uh, as you said, what could be the next contribution to, to increase uh, successfulness in the area. Uh, would you want us to write the overview paper then or follow the development paper? It depends where your weight lies. So. Um, uh, I mean, um, if 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 you're if you have and wanted to develop a prototype, um, I, I suspect that this would have been also a bit more at the center of the presentation today, right? Uh, uh, already, uh, so then it you because you would get feedback on this. What you got mostly today was feedback on the the overview discussion, the contextualization of the paper. Um, you can discuss ideas that you have about a potential prototype, you know, arguably more briefly here, um, and perhaps there is enough space, but it probably wouldn't be, I'm, I'm not sure if you would try and find the time and frame to do it to that particular extent, in addition to the review you would do in your literature. So um, you can sketch a prototype here if you want to. And you know, as I mentioned, you can deviate from the, from the, um, on the strict structure that's proposed here and say, you know, a, a proposed initial prototype. So for example, you see, oh, based on the literature review, we identified gaps one, two, three, four, five, right? And then here's a prototype that could integrate those and you can have write one paragraph of how that could look like or two or so. But if you wanted to develop a comprehensive approach that also has, you know, schemata of the architectures or, uh, you know, describe the integration of the gamification elements in great detail, that would clearly follow in the development paper approach. So they're not exclusive, but the weight, the focus is uh, uh, very clear in those distinct papers. Because the development paper, conversely, also needs to make reference to existing work. You can't just reinvent the wheel either way, right? So you need to kind of at least say, what, what, what are you basing your work on and uh, how do you ensure that you don't just uh, invent something or reinvent something that has been developed elsewhere? Does that make sense? In, in my mind, Christopher, I think mm -hmm. uh, in development paper, you have this evaluation and I, and I mm -hmm. think that if you aren't able to properly evaluate, either through uh, 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 what is it, uh, an abstract construct saying what should be the functionality, what should be the expected behavior, or you have some real user testing, if you can't evaluate, then I think you're better off doing the first, saying, okay, this is, this is literature, and the literature as a hip hypothesis, we conclude that future work would be to build this thing. Mm. Now, if you build the thing, I don't think it's worth much if you can't evaluate, if you can't assess it. So, so if, the, uh, if you just make something and we can show it works, it has very limited contribution power. So, so if you want to make a development paper, I think you need to push it to the, to, the, to the point where you can actually somehow assess and evaluate, either, as you said, through some experiment or some user testing, or if you want to do it uh, more uh, theoretically, then you need to do work quite a lot on how are you gonna actually assess this so that we can say it was good, these decisions were good, not just, okay, I made it, because that has li a very limited value. Mm. Very good point, yeah. I mean, the assessment is really the king, uh, the key here. That's that's what makes it mastery, uh, and that's you know in the master's course, not just the development. Um, that's a core point. And uh, as Runa says, you'll probably not get there if you uh, bearing the weight here, because it would really mean that you really need to get going and develop this thing, right, before you can evaluate it. And I'm slightly doubtful that this is um, um, sensible to entertain at this stage. But 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 we'll give you a liberty, of course. Does it help? I think Gruner's contextualization was really useful here. Any other questions or points? Just feel free to budge in because I don't see the participant list right now. So if you, no, um, I don't. Hi, Christopher. I have a question about the overview paper. Yeah. Uh, 
I have read it and it says uh, if it's uh, one person, it can be uh, in a limit of eight papers, uh, eight pages. Mm. Uh, and uh, in the, if it's two people, two people, the limit is 12. Uh, what if it's three people? Like we are, we are three yeah. people in the one topic, like science education. Yeah. Um... There's a synergetic element in 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 in, in, in those um, cases. Um, a twelve pager in a I triple E is already a pretty tight one. Um, so there's a lot of writing already. Um, I'll discuss with Runa what's what's sensible there um, and come back to you. I just don't want to throw just the number out. Um, Oh, um, or maybe I don't know. Like, uh, are we allowed to uh, write the one uh, report overview paper uh, as a team, like uh, three people, because we are presenting together and we are, we will be uh, researching together, probably. I, I I don't I don't I, I generally I would say yes, but it means your scope considerably extends. What doesn't extend is generally the idea of the introduction, uh, you know, in terms of scope and, and, and conclusions on. But what will extend is primarily, possibly the. Uh, um, uh, yeah, basically all this here. Um, so the background you want to describe, um, if it, if you can extend the scope a bit, the method it will be more comprehensive, hopefully, and of course you will hopefully have more results to present. And this is the kind of uh, those are the kind of elements that kind of will expand uh, as part of your uh, um, collaboration. I, I think usually conclusions and introduction are reasonably uh, stable, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, um, apply a factor three there. Um, but it's the workload in the center, so that's why. But in principle, I'd say, sure, it should be possible. Why not? I mean, uh, if there's a more promising outcome at the end, that would be really helpful. Uh, and in fact, many of the survey papers are actually written by teams, often very large teams, uh, simply because of the workload. Yeah. So uh, let us come back to that. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, leave it uh, for, for there right now. Um, yeah. So I mean, the 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 lowest page limit for uh, for individual reports is uh, six, right? So eight is the max that I would think that is uh, uh, admissible for 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 single uh, individual reports. Bear in mind the variability comes about uh, based on the use of um, elements, you know, such as um, visual elements in particular, like figures, tables, and the like, that can quickly affect your page count. And we want to be kind of permissive towards this. Um, I'm not arguing that people should forcefully um, extend it to a text level that, um, you know, and sh uh, that is a sure only be text. So make use of visual elements. Other thoughts? Seems we're good then for now. Well, in any case, if you have issues, you can lodge them as an issue and we'll address them. And uh, um, I'll send a response or refinement based on uh, uh, Utkubek's um, inquiry right just now uh, as an issue as well. So you have clarity on this and uh, we'll clarify it in the um, wiki. Other than this, I uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Please bear in mind next week uh, we have the Easter holiday and please correct me if I got this wrong because I think now the time is a bit of a flux so it doesn't really matter if it's holiday or not because it's in a different structure I suspect but it basically means um, that next week we will not have our session uh, but the week thereafter. So the ones that are responsible for the next session please be mindful. Christopher mind I think there are actually two Mondays off. Oh now it becomes evil. Thanks, Runa. Yeah, because in Norway we have that Monday That's right. after Easter Sunday. That's off as well. correct. That's correct. Okay, let's scrap that holiday and do never let. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, that's right. We have two Mondays off. That's a tight one. Um, hang on. Let me just bring up our little schedule. So just just to be ensure that we're on the same page. Because if you have gaps in between, in my experience, that's often tricky that people uh, that that um, yeah we do. So next time we meet actually is on the 20th of April. Hui, um, that's well into April. Um, yeah, so in any case, while it writes spring break here, I don't necessarily suggest that it will be a break, but rather you want to use it already to actually structure and write your report, essentially. 
And the proposal was that you can hand in an earlier version of your report, mid of April for our vetting. So it would basically be an opportunity to get some feedback on it. It's not, it's not required, it's purely optional. Um, so that uh, you have opportunities for refining it. Um, and then we can submit it in um, at the end of this very week. So 4th of May is the last presentation uh, run by uh, Wilde Vega and Vega uh, on, on news games in particular. And um, after that, uh, th this end of the week will be basically the deadline. So, yeah, so it's something to be to be mindful of. Um, I'll make that explicit. Um, we, we have tied down, nearly tied down the exam dates as well. Uh, we'll um, assign you individual uh, slots already, and then you have an iteration of going through and see if there are conflict with certain arrangements and so on uh, before we really uh, tie this down. Um, this would be in the um, second week of May. Um, yes, must be second week of May, um, that we plan the actual oral exams. But uh, for now, bear in mind, those two weeks may be off, but yeah, perhaps hopefully not really um, in terms of uh, preparing and writing the report. If there are any questions, um, you can yeah, raise them now or by a wiki and we go from there. No? I take this as a no. Oh, the, no. Uh, is there a follow up with Quebec? Because I see a raised hand, or is it still raised? Oh, it was Sorry, I forgot to yeah to unraise it. Yeah, that's a weird weird concept, right? Raising your hand and unraising it as well. That's uh, not something that you need to worry about in a classroom setting. Anyway, um, thanks for your attention. Um, we went over time, of course, as usual. So um, then we leave it to. Everyone, I just got an injection here on the twentieth of April. Yeah, exactly. Health and wellness, 20th of April, yeah, uh, Clara, uh, Morton, or Nikolai. Yeah, good, 20th of April, you'll be then. Um, and then we meet, yeah, on the very much on the 20th of April. Uh, of course, please get in touch um, earlier, um, uh, um, uh, Clara, Nikolai, and Morton, just with respect to the paper, so we can briefly discuss it. That said, you probably wanted to look at a, um, a development a paper, because I specifically think that you are interested in doing so. Um, and then we go from there. Good. Well, as far as I'm concerned, happy Easter and um, stay healthy and safe. Ah, blue. Right. There's one comment as to whether all exams will be cancelled. No, we, they will be held digitally. They will not be cancelled.